Hey everybody, welcome back to my kitchen table. Um, I swear, trying to get away from this to get some videos going, but I just keep ending up right here. Um, speaking of this kitchen table, this is where I shot the uh, video on how to design a garden where I shared some of my non garden designer tips for how to design your own space. And actually I have to tell you guys, I almost didn't post that video. I just felt like it was feeling a little boring. I never want to come across like I'm just blabbing to you guys. And it felt like there was a lot of blabbing going on there. Um, and then it turns out that a lot of you really liked that. And a lot of you had some really good questions. So I thought since I can't get outside to do a winter garden tour video today, like I had hoped to, I thought maybe the thing to do was just do a little mini Q and A and answer some of those questions. Cause a lot of the same questions were coming up. So first of all, a lot of you asked for continuing that series and following that project along. So I will definitely do that. Um, I will tell you that I was, um, I have been putting off that project for a long time because there is a lot of work that needs to be done in that area. There is a lot of site prep and that is daunting to me. Um, but I just have to, I just have to bear down and get it done. Um, there's, and sometimes that's what you have to do. Um, every time I have tried to take a shortcut in a garden project by, especially in that prep part, I have regretted it. It's just to me, gardening, a new garden project is just like painting. It's all in the prep work. And I regret it every time I take a shortcut. So I'm just gonna barrel through it and do it properly. And I will absolutely shoot some more videos because you all seem to be very interested in that. Okay, so on to the questions. Uh, Jessica Booman asked, I know ideally you'd be able to lay out everything in containers to see where it should all go before planting, but what if you can only buy a couple things at a time? Is it better to purchase as you find the plants you want or better to save up for a while and buy everything at once? She said, you know, should, if she buys things as she sees them, should she hang on to them and plant them all at the same time? So a lot of this is personal preference. Um, certainly in an ideal world, you have all your plant material and you are able to set that all on the ground and lay it out. Um, but a lot of times that's not possible. A lot of us don't have the budget to go buy all of the plants for one project at one time. Um, a lot of us don't have the time to necessarily do that. So I do think that's sort of the optimal situation. If you can't do that though, I would say, you know, what you really want to do then is really nail down on your design because that way you know exactly where things are going to go. So I would say spend some extra time really nailing down your design, having a very good idea of where things are gonna go. I would start by planting trees. In any case, I would start by planting trees and shrubs, which are really sort of structural plants, um, because you want to try to not move those if you can um, and get those in the right place. And then the rest of the design kind of comes together. And if you've got your design on paper kind of narrowed down, it's a lot easier to go back and just fill things in and you can adjust on the fly. And remember when you're planting perennials, it's not, or even annuals, it's not a big deal to move things. It's okay. I mean, obviously you'd rather not do the same job twice, but if something is bothering you, you can move it. So it's not set in stone. Once you get in there, it's not like you're pouring a concrete path. You've got some wiggle room on those things. So start with your shrubs and trees and then fill in with your perennials. And if you buy them in chunks, that's fine. Just have a really good idea of where they're going to go so that you don't end up replanting things and really kind of wasting your time. Tracy Healy says, uh, my Wisconsin yard is wooded and we've been clearing areas for the garden. It's been a tough process though. Do you have any tips for creating a garden in area that's not been cultivated before? Well, that's exactly what I'm doing in this area. So follow along for that. It's really tough. And I would say the first thing you need to do is get out any really invasive, noxious weeds and you have to get them out properly, dig them out. Um, if they're truly invasive, um, you may have to resort to um, an herbicide. Um, I obviously try not to do that. And there are some places in my garden where I won't do that at all. Um, but that's an option you may have to consider. But digging them out is really, you, you get them out in one fell swoop if you dig them out. So anything really aggressive or a noxious or invasive weed, you got to start by digging it out and don't even, don't bother skipping that step because it is just going to lead to frustration. After that, 
you know, I think what you need to do is you have to figure out some way to deal with the rest of the vegetation that's there. So one of the ways I plan on dealing with it in my yard, my yard is after I dig out the really noxious stuff, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to chop it back. I'm probably going to, I could maybe rent a brush mower, um, chop it all back, all the scalp it down. And I'm going to um, either put cardboard or several layers of newspaper over it to help smother it out. And then I will fill in the top there with some more topsoil. Um, or you know, if you can work on this over time, that cardboard will break down. But the idea is you really want to get that vegetation that's there down. The other thing you have to think about is that if you're starting in a wooded area, you probably, or a formerly wooded area, there's probably a lot of tree roots and tree stumps around. And I would say, think about small plants in that case, because in small plants, you can pop those in around tree roots much easier than a big plant. And you are going to have to be a little bit more flexible on your design because sometimes you're not going to be able to plant a tree exactly where you'd hope to, because you're going to run into a massive tree root and it's very hard to get those out of the ground. So that's where I would start with that process. And I would say just sort of steal yourself because it's not easy, but it's worth it. Okay. Carrie R says, do you have any tips or suggestions on how you recreate a garden? For example, if the area is overgrown, the configuration of the garden is not working anymore, plants have grown on other spots, or say if you have a garden area that you've been adding plants over time and now it's completely filled, but it's just a huge garden with all types of plants um, uh, packed into it. Yeah, I do. In fact, that's exactly what I did um, with the patio garden last year. I was not happy with where that garden was going. So I started it as though it was a garden I was designing from scratch. I designed it exactly the same way that I talked about in the video, used that same process. And then I kept in mind the things that were existing that I wanted to keep. And then I drew those into the plan as static items that had to be in there. And then I designed around it. Now, I would start with that same concept. And then if there are plants in that garden that are still good that you'd like to reuse, you know, think about how you can incorporate those into the design. But certainly if they're overgrown, you're probably going to want to divide them, um, clean them up. You might even want to move them to a different spot in that garden and design things a little more carefully. But it's, you know, all that division and everything is probably good for them anyways. And then you can give the extras away to someone or use them somewhere else in your garden. But I would approach revamping a garden bed exactly the same way I approach uh, designing a brand new one. Diane, whose last name I'm never going to be able to pronounce, I'm very sorry, said, please do a video on how to choose a garden style. Um, I will try to do a video on that um, if I can think of a good way to present it. I have done some blog posts on that in the past um, a long time ago, and I will link to some of those that might be helpful. But my suggestion for that, and, and I don't know if this is specific to me or if this works for a lot of people, but what I do when I'm sort of struggling to find a direction is I look at every picture I can find. I go through my garden magazines. I look at Pinterest. I look at how's, I look at, I look at other people's blogs. I do everything I can. And when something, and, and the best thing you can do is go to other gardens. That is, that will tell you right there. Almost always you will find something you love if you're standing in a space and you can kind of get a feeling for being in that space. So that's what I do is I start with that and then I just save everything. And then you can go back once you save it all. And what I do is I don't, if I like it, I like it. And I don't think any more about what I like about it. Then I go back and I look at what are the common factors among all these things. And I can kind of pick up the, the style, the general style that I like. Now, keep in mind that sometimes, um, your, the architecture style of your house does dictate your garden style to a certain extent. Now I believe you can do whatever you want. You can stick whatever kind of garden you want, but I will say sometimes it does feel a little bit more cohesive. If you have a very distinctive architecture style in your house that you pick that up and make do a garden that works with that well. So one of the things you might want to do is uh, do a Google search for images with the architectural style of your house and then say garden after it, um, because that might help you find some pictures that would give you inspiration. That's a little bit more specific to, um, to your house. Now, for instance, some things definitely are out of place and you can, if you're up for enough work, you can do anything. 
for instance, a tropical garden here would seem very out of place, but you know, if I really wanted to do it and I had a greenhouse and I was up for moving a lot of plants around a lot, I probably could manage it if I really wanted to. So you can do anything you want, but some things I think are a more natural fit. Okay, Cynthia Mendoza said, um, can you talk a little bit about how you factor in color when designing a garden? I'm currently in the middle of planting a rose garden bed with lots of different hot hues, purple, yellow, orange, and red, and some white. And I'm really concerned about how to pull it all together. I'd love to hear your thoughts on color in the garden. You know, this is where the non-artist in me gets a little wary because I don't truly understand color theory like artists do. I mean, I think we all learned a little bit in elementary school art class about how complementary colors work and what that does. But I would say, generally when I'm designing a garden, I usually try to stick to a range of colors. I don't generally jump all over. So I, I mean, my go-to is always, I'm very partial to pinks and peaches and blues, which are also known as purple. Um, those colors um, all work really well for me and I love a shot of chartreuse in there. Once you get to like the, the goldy yellows and the oranges and the reds, I, I like those combinations and I actually have one area of the garden where I do put those color plants together. Um, but I generally feel like those don't blend as well with the other things. So I think you have to, it's important to keep a color palette in mind. Certainly what I would do is um, do the same thing with the pictures, pull a bunch of pictures, hopefully that are flowers, and throw them together and see how they work together. And then I think having a unifying plant, a unifying theme, a unifying color can help a lot. So one of the um, colors that I use in my garden a lot that I feel helps to bridge the gap between different colors is that sort of chartreuse um, green. So that is in that uh, Nicotiana Alada lime green that I like to grow. It's in um, lemon coral sedum. There's a whole bunch of plants that bring out that kind of chartreuse color and I feel like that is a really good uniter in the garden. So I also think if you're going to have a lot of different colors in the garden it's even more important to do um, blocks rather than individual plants and I also feel like it's really important to have unifying plants throughout so I think and a place to sort of rest your eyes so I think um, evergreens in a garden like that maybe boxwood something like that can help a lot in terms of helping the garden flow even though you're incorporating a lot of colors to it but I would say definitely don't you know, do plant in mass, especially if you're going to be incorporating more colors because um, it really gives your eyes a lot of places to go and you do want your eye to rest a little bit. The other thing I would say is I think you have to be a little careful with white. I love white gardens, but if you put a white flowering plant in the middle of a garden that is extremely colorful, in terms of really bright poppy colors and you put a white plant in there, it is gonna make your eye stop. So make sure you want your eye to stop there and know that going in. Uh, Jennifer LaFleur said, hi Erin, uh, what's the name of the app you used for design? I should have mentioned that in the article. It's called, um, it's called Concepts. It's called Concepts. It is not a garden specific it's not a garden specific app, um, but it is, it does have graph paper. It's a design app and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, it works really good. I have the Apple pencil, so it works really good, but you can pick what kind, size of graph paper you want in there. This is actually, um, this is one of my many drawings of the patio garden that we redid last year. So it does have graph paper on it. Um, so you can pick your graph paper and then I just designed from there. And of course it's got um, a color wheel so you can, you know, Obviously, you can pick lots of colors and things. So that's what I use. I don't think it was free. I think it was maybe 10 or 20 bucks or there was some part of it that I paid 20 or 10 or 20 bucks for. It. Whatever it was, it was well worth it. I use it all the time. Susan Kilpatrick and a lot of other people over the past few videos have asked me about the posters behind me. Um, so these are vintage botanical posters. I got them on Etsy several years ago. I'm sure you can still find them. Um, I also know there are reproductions available, so you can also go that route. Um, I will put the name of the company that did them. It's a German company. 
Jung Kok Quentel. Quentel. I'll write it in the description so you guys can search for that specifically. They're the ones who made all these botanical posters. Um, Daryl Grimaldi says, I have a brand new home in a brand new state and zone. This will be my second garden on a new lot, but it's still quite arduous. Um, I'm heading to a garden show this weekend. And there'll be local designers, so I'm hoping to find a good one. Sometimes trying to save money ends up costing more if you don't get those bones right. Um, I just want to, there's not a question in there, but I just want to say, Dar I think Daryl points out the perfect time when it's a good idea to go out and seek some design help. In particular, if you are moving to a new zone, a new area, um, and if you've got a really blank canvas, I think those are all times when it's a really good idea to seek some professional help of the garden design variety. Um, a lot of garden designers offer coaching, coaching services or consul consultations. So I would suggest you could start with that. If you don't have enough money to do a full garden design, hire somebody spend a couple hundred bucks on it because I guarantee you, I mean, a couple hundred bucks doesn't go that far in plant material. So by avoiding mistakes, you will absolutely save money on that. So, and especially, I mean, if I were moving to a new zone, the first thing I would do if I was designing a garden was go find a professional to consult with me on it because, you know, we all know our own gardens pretty well and every garden has a bit of a microclimate in it. Sorry, the dog just moved the camera. Um, Every garden has a bit of a microclimate in it. So if you're getting out of that, it's a, maybe a really good idea to get some local help on that. Oh, um, Sweet Stuff says, can you tell me the name of that book and author? Um, yeah, I should have mentioned that. I should have put that in the description. The description wasn't as good as it normally was because was, it was a last minute thing because I was thinking about not posting that video. Uh, this is the book. It's Planting the Natural Garden. It's by um, P. Udoff and Hank... Uh, Gerritsen um, with um, editing by Noel Kingsbury um, who's worked on a lot of books with Pete before. Um, so I will put a link to this in the description and I will also link to several other garden design books that might be helpful. Um, I would say this book is is primarily lists of plants that Pete uses in his designs um, and it's very good and it's a great resource but there's no zone information on here. There's no information about the plant that would include whether it's deer resistant or not. So it's definitely more of a starting point rather than, rather than the only source you're going to need to consult. Blue Sky 7226 says, uh, Aaron, I love that you have a drone. What type do you have? So, uh, yeah, I got a drone for Christmas. Santa was good to me. Uh, not that I hadn't hinted strongly. Um, I just, you guys, I just got the, uh, the this is it, the DJI Mavic Mini. Uh, and I'm still working on figuring out. So you haven't seen a lot yet in it, but I'm having a ton of fun with it. Um, that's it. That's as big as it is. It, it looks like a toy, but it does a great job. So I'm having a lot of fun figuring it out. Um, you know, I did spend a lot of time reading up on drone regulations and drone laws. And I am being very conscientious to not invade people's privacy because there's something, if you've ever been somewhere and there's a drone hovering over you, it's extremely obnoxious. So I'm being very careful on my videos to try to not get my neighbor's properties. And I don't even shoot that direction. I just keep pointing the thing towards our property. But I do think it's gonna be extremely helpful uh, for me in my gardening to get those overhead views. And I have already identified two places where I need to fix things because the shape of the bed is terrible and it's driving me nuts. And it actually explains why some things, seeing that overhead view explains to me why some things aren't working in those gardens to begin with. Oh, and then several people asked about deer repellent because I mentioned that I do use deer repellent. I rely on it heavily. Um, I use several kinds of deer repellent. I have for a long time, I used, for a long time I used a homemade one and I did a blog post about that and I will put the link to my homemade deer repellent. The only problem with the homemade deer repellent is that you can't put it through a pump sprayer. You almost have to, and it even will clog up the rosette on a watering can. So it's a little difficult to apply. You almost have to put it in a watering can and sort of swing it around. So I like to use a pump sprayer because I need to cover a wide area and it's a really good way to coat everything. 
So I generally use Messina's Deer Stopper 2. Um, I also like uh, Bobex and Plant Sked is also good. The thing I like about the Messina's and the reason I reach to that one the most is that it does not have an unpleasant odor. Most deer, repe deer repellents have a very unpleasant odor. And as soon as it dries down, it goes away. Your garden doesn't continue to smell like that. But it's, it's really pretty terrible when you first apply it, especially if you're covering your whole garden. So that Messina's Deer Stopper smells like cinnamon and cloves. And it works very well for me. I do not change it up that often. The key is you got to get that on before they start nibbling on it. Because you think, oh, this is me. Oh, but look, the deer aren't going to eat in my garden this year. Oh, that's great. Look, they haven't touched a thing. They're not going to, that's wonderful. I finally figured out the deer have moved on. They're not going to come into my garden and eat things this year. And then you wake up one morning and your deer and your garden is like flattened. And of course, you can't fix that once that happens. So the key is, and you guys can remind me later on because I will forget too. The key is to apply it before you need it. Apply it. They love that fresh new growth. Start going on it early in spring as things start growing. If you put in a new plant, no matter what it is, even if it's deer resistant, cover it up because I found that my deer don't believe that it's deer resistant until they try it and they will test virtually anything. They might not like it and they might not come back to that plant, but they will test it the first time. So everything gets sprayed and then uh, it will last a very long time if you don't get rain. If you do get a heavy rain, you got to go back out there and reapply. But I can go a good three weeks in between applications unless we get like a major downpour. So I think that works out pretty well and it's not that bad. I buy it concentrated in gallon sizes and diluted in a pump sprayer. I go through about two, two to three gallons a year. And it's about, it's about a hundred bucks a gallon, but you get, I think you dilute it by one to 10. So you're getting 10 gallons out of each gallon. That was a long way to talk about deer repellent. Okay. So I think that covers most of the questions I was trying to hit on the ones that were, that were repetitive. Um, not because I mind repetitive questions by any means. Uh, it's just that I think a lot of people have those questions. And so I hope that was somewhat helpful to you. I'm not going to do like regular Q and A's or something. I just was surprised by how many people liked this video and had questions on it. So I thought it'd be helpful to just pop on and quickly talk about those. And of course, like I said before, I definitely will keep you guys coming along for the journey. It is not going to be pretty at times. I guarantee you that because there are, there are some unsavory bits that are going to have to happen over there, but I will take you along for that. Um, so stay tuned. A lot of it's not going to happen until probably April. So that's why I didn't want to wait too long before I answered some of these questions for you because April seems like a long way away today. All right, that's it. Thank